the first like 30 odd years of my life, if you like. I really think the two major things from those first two jobs was in the military. I learned how, I learned about discipline really. Um, discipline has helped me in later life with kit, with the way I organize my own personal life to actually being disciplined enough to think big about expeditions and then go out and try and execute them the best I can. Um, and then in the fire and rescue service, the biggest thing that I learned was how to deal with very stressful situations, but without any emotion. So to be as effective as I can in the moment with the right equipment, the right team around us, and, and to deal with that singular situation as quickly and as effective as possible. And, and those two lessons have really been brought into now the, the area that I work in, which is leadership in the extremes. I mainly work in cold places. So like Antarctica, the Arctic Circle, Alaska, the Canadian, uh, Norwegian High Arctic, touching on the Russian High Arctic as well. And as the introduction very kindly pointed out, I've been to the North Geographic Pole and the South Geographic Pole. Uh, I guided Top Gear to the magnetic North Pole and I crossed um, a place called Ellesmere Island which is a very remote uh, area. I'm, I hate saying it but it's probably the size of Wales but everything's the size of Wales. Um, <laughs> so poor old Wales. Um, but we, I crossed that and they call it the Horizontal Everest because it's so difficult to cross. Um, and I was one of just two people who actually crossed that area and guided teams to the geomagnetic North Pole. So they were all the North Pole, the pole sort of headlines to it. But I've done 14 other major expeditions in the Arctic. Um, and then I guided in the Himalayas quite a lot uh, from low level five and a half thousand meter um, base camp treks right up to Everest um, expeditions as well. Uh, and we've taken novices like us guys from ordinary walks of life and trained them to be survivalists really in cold weather conditions. So taking people out of their offices and we put them into uh, mountains or into polar areas and just train them to survive. Uh, and what it really, I think what it really teaches you at the end of the day is less about the environment that you're walking through and more about yourself. Um, when you're standing in the extremes and you can feel the, the full force of mother nature in front of you, then it strips away any ego or pretense that you have. And it holds up a mirror to you, if you like, to see yourself for who you really are. And a lot of people don't like that because we all sort of walk around in normal life with pretense in front of us. Um, so to have that stripped away and to see your weaknesses exposed to the team is, is something that people don't like. But if you can work your way through that and you're trained in the right way, then the development of that is extraordinary. And you come back from an expedition feeling uh, honest, remarkable, uh, driven, focused with clarity, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, but that's what it gives to me. Expeditions give me a real sense of who I am. But the other side of expeditions, through all the journeys that I've done, um, has taught me about the environment. Uh, when I first started my very first expedition, I didn't really care about the environment. That's my honest truth to you. It was more about me pushing myself physically and mentally in the extremes and being that polar explorer that I'd read about in books of Ralph Fiennes and uh, Tom Crean and Ernest Shackleton and all these great people. And I just wanted to be in that position of pulling a sledge. Um, but over the years and working with the Inuit people and the Nepalese and, and seeing the true worth of this planet, it really changed my direction of how I wanted to explore. Uh, to the extent that I started to uh, run education programs. Um, and that is a long conversation in itself. So to make this short, the very first expedition I did, I was crossing the Northwest Passage over a four week, week expedition in the high Arctic Canada. And every other day, excuse me, <coughs> every other day I was 
uh, on my satellite phone connecting to my old school Finham Park Comprehensive in uh, Coventry. And the children were sat around some speakers and I was saying, oh, it's Mark here, I'm on the Northwest Passage and they would ask me questions. So 18 years later on Everest, which was last year, um, I increased that number to 1.2 million students worldwide. So the audience that I built is around education from all parts of the globe. Um, and I think if anybody was going to ask me what I'm most proud of with what I've done, it's actually the outreach that we've had to these wonderful young people around the world. But the teachings that we give actually resonate with all ages because the, the problem that I found was how do I talk from the extremes to young people in New York, in Africa, in Alaska, in all different areas of the world. They're all different, these children, um, in culture and in environment where they live. So I came up with four things. First one, and this resonates with everybody, first one is have a total respect for yourself. Understand who you are and respect yourself because everything in life comes from here. Um, and then secondly, have an equal respect for the environment. So I don't want people to look at the whole globe and save the planet that way, though there are individuals out there doing that. Um, but just to look at your own environment and see how you can contribute and encourage others to appreciate what's around them. And then thirdly, it, it was about just thinking differently about life. Um, because as I say, I'm from Coventry, I went to a comprehensive school, and now I do you know, global expeditions. And I carry this brand of exploration all the way through what I do and promote modern day exploration. So I do think differently about life. And the final one is something that I really struggle with. Um, I'm 53 years old and I struggle with having fun. I work, uh, I work a lot on exploration. It's my passion, my drive. And sometimes I find it difficult to step back and um, enjoy it, enjoy the moment. So they're the four things that I sort of teach students. The way that we teach them is through this medium. So I spoke to Skype about, must be 10 years ago now, when they were only three years old. And I said, I want to take the Skype technology onto a mountain and have a backdrop of Mount Everest and speak to as many children as possible in their own schools around the world. So they helped me with that. And we started to create these education extreme programs. Now in 2013, after I'd done the solo to the North and South Pole, I wanted to do an ascent of Mount Everest. So I formed a team. Um, I spent 72 days on the mountain, three weeks on my own training. And then when we started to do the approach to Mount Everest, I started to link with the schools around the world. 10,000 students were involved with that expedition um, in 40 different countries. Um, these kids were following us all the way through. So during the day, we'd set this medium up and they would be sitting in their schools in Australia or wherever it was. And then we would say hi to them from the Himalayas with a great backdrop. And we carried that all the way through to Camp 4, which is just below 8,000 meters at a saddle on Mount Everest. And it takes you roughly 45 days to get to that position. Um, and in that position, you're actually also in the, in the death zone as well. And you might have heard about the death zone, but it's when your body is only taking in 30% oxygen. So you'll find it very difficult to breathe. Um, the, the oxygen around your body isn't really getting to your brain. So your decisions are swayed. The pressure that you're at is just below an international flight, flight a few thousand meters below. Uh, but you're about five miles up when you're heading up towards Everest anyway. So the pressure is really quite intense. So to get to that moment um, is pretty special anyway. But on that night, which was the 19th of May in, 2000, uh, in, in uh, 2013, I stepped out of my tent and it was minus 45. Um, and your freezers are minus 18. So that gives you an indication of the cold. Uh, there was a 45, there was a 50 mile an hour sidewind coming in from the left. 
we've put pressure on the bodies climbing. And we hooked ourselves onto the safety line and we started to do the ascent. Uh, 200 meters away from the summit, we were the only team operating there. Um, it was in darkness and my friend Singy uh, dropped to his knees and fell against the mountain. I picked him up, looked at his face, shouted at him, are you okay? And he wasn't really responding. So I headed back to my friend Peter, who's just behind me, who's a doctor. And I said, Pete, um, Singy's dying, I think. And Peter said, my feet are frozen, I need to head back. So then we looked to the fourth member of the team who was abseiling into the darkness back to camp four. So who's uh, really leaving the team. So I was left in a position where I could see the head torches of the climbers reaching the summit of Mount Everest. Um, but I had two people, one that was potentially dying and the other one who had frozen feet. And I needed to make a decision. That decision was based on years of experience of safety through the military, through rescue, and through 30 odd major expeditions. And it was also based on the fact that I'm a human being. And as a human being, I had to make, I, I realized that a, a life is bigger than a mountain. So we abort, I aborted the expedition there and then. We started to carry the guy down, and I'm telling you this, to carry somebody down in, in 30% oxygen is the hardest thing you could ever do. As he started to move down the mountain, he's found his feet a little bit. We got to camp four, we've got him in the tent, kept him alive. Long story short, for three days, we walked back to base camp. We walked back to the village and everybody lived on that expedition. Now, that's not always the decision that people make. They think that reaching the summit of a mountain, reaching the North or South Pole is the success of an expedition. It isn't. It's coming back alive and doing things like this, delivering honest accounts of your exploration, which I feel is the success of a journey. From Shackleton to Armstrong to Peary to someone like me, we've all got one thing in common, and that's we're all storytellers. Uh, honest stories um, draw people into what you're saying. So one of the most remote areas that I traveled through was Antarctica. It's a long story, which I'm not going to talk about, but I will tell you about day five. On day five, I lost my iPod, which was my music, my books, my brain stimulation for 50 days. I had 360 of a white horizon. No animals, no people, nothing apart from my own brain, my body moving through this white void. And when you lose your iPod and you count 3000 ski steps before you go, I can't do this. It's remarkable how weak you can get physically and men men mentally. So I sat in my tent and I broke down. And I know I've looked at people coming into this room this evening and it's we're, it, there's, a, there's a certain age group in here. But I'm not afraid to say that I sat in my tent and I broke down. I cried. I thought, I can't do this. And it wasn't crying for the cameras. It was crying for myself. I was weak. And I phoned my friend up who, who uh, I've been on many expeditions with. And we'd had a conversation prior to the expedition. I said, I'm going to phone you in the first week and tell you I'm going to give up and you're going to put me back on my feet again. And the reason that we did that was because everything at the beginning of an expedition, at the beginning of education, beginning of business, beginning of a project, anything you do which tests you is tough at the beginning because you're trying to find your feet, you're trying to work it all out. And my weakness was there. He taught me, he taught me to get back on my feet again and I did the simplistic motion of putting one foot in front of the other. And then 45 days, I reached the South Pole. That's the quick version. Okay. Um, moving on from there, before we have questions, I do want to tell you about what I'm doing next. Uh, I've got to the point now where we've created this wide global audience of young people, but also businesses as well, um, outside of the virus. I'm actually doing this for a living. So I give talks online like this. So there's a lot of 
interest in modern day explorers who are trying to expose the reality of climate change. Um, and also they're interested in leadership uh, strategy, um, how you move brands forward, etc. So there's a lot of interest in what we're doing at the moment. So what I'm going to do next is a, an expedition called Solo 100. It's a test for me because it's doubling what I did in Antarctica. It's going to be 100 days alone, um, crossing a section of the Arctic, which I'm not going to release yet because I know what it is, but we're speaking to companies about it first. But Guinness World Records are involved because it's about surviving alone for a hundred days with your own equipment, your own food, moving forward, uh, crossing this great void of what, what which we're going to go through. Um, but the importance of the 100 is this. Every single day of the expedition, there's going to be a film released from students around the world. They're going to tell people who they are, their names, um, where they live. So they're going to humanize th their video by telling them how, how normal they are. And then they're going to tell you about their issues with climate change and their, and finally their um, pledge towards climate action. So at the end of the expedition, not only will you get this great journey, but you'll also get 100 films, 100 pledges, 100 new Gretas to lead the way in climate action, um, which I think is very, very powerful. A lot of organizations attached to this, International Scouting Movement uh, is one of them. They'll be running the education program. But we've also got two production companies, one called Diamond Docks, which did Icarus and before the flood with DiCaprio and eight days a week with the Beatles, etc. And the other production company is in London called Hardy, Son and Baker, which is the actor Tom Hardy's production company. And Tom is very kindly doing the voiceover for the film that we're doing, Solo 100. And the film started three years ago when we were operating with anti-poaching teams in Africa, riding with dog sledding teams in Alaska, um, working in inner city schools in New York and in the UK as well. Um, they filmed on Everest and their major part of the film is going to be my solo across uh, the Arctic on this Solo 100 expedition. That was due to go in March. It's still registered for that, but we are in uncertain times. So the way I cope with this, and this will be the end of the, the talk, if you like, the way I cope with it is we are living in a moment where it's unprecedented. And in moments like this, you need to, you need to work you need to listen to a single single body, if you like, which is the government. I know this is up for debate and controversial and everybody has their own opinion, but I've been in a situation where, and this is a good comparison, I think. When I was in the fire and rescue service, we'd have multi-car pileups on motorways with bodies and mayhem and chaos. We'd arrive and straight away, you'd get a commander standing there, commander control. And his job was to make sure the area was safe and he would direct people into the scene of the accident, into the scene of the chaos. And in the chaos, you'd have effective people workingly, working on casualties, making safe the scene and uh, trying to end that chaos, if you like. Standing next to the commander, there'd be paramedics, there'd be further firefighters with cutting gear. Behind them, you'd have the police, and various other people waiting as well. Well, in the current situation, we've got the chaos, which is the virus. You've got the commander, which is uh, basically the government. And beside them, you've got WHO, and you've got other organizations as well, waiting to be directed into the scene. And behind them, you then have all of the services that we see operating at the moment, the postal service, the food industry, et cetera, et cetera. And then just behind them, we've got all the other good people who are listening to the direction of the government. Everybody is playing a part within this um, scenario that we're in at the moment. And that's my role. I need to just play a part, plan my expeditions, plan my future, but 
at the moment I've got to act accordingly. And that's the only way we will see a quick positive result out of this. I think during the questions, if you ask me of what's happened over the last 48 hours of the government, I, I'm, happy, ha I'm happy to chat about that, but I don't want to talk too much on it now because I realise I've, I've talked quite a lot. Of so there's my life from working in, uh, growing up in Coventry um, to moving through the military and fire and rescue to leading expeditions. And my reason for exploring is to expose how wonderful this planet is. Um, to everybody and that's my passion and drive so thank you very much